Shabbat Shalom. We're thankful this morning for another Shabbat. And this day we would like to look at the subject Transcendent Robe, Transparent Righteousness. The transparent righteousness and the transcendent robe of Yahweh. What do we mean? Well, we know that Yah is transcendent in that he is beyond our own comprehension. He cannot be seen in essence. He is bigger than we can even conceive. And we cannot bring him by way of our conception to see him. But he reveals his, uh, himself through Yeshua. So this morning we would like to look at the eminency of his transcendency. In that his transcendency... Deals with the idea that you cannot contain Yah in a building. But he reveals himself in the imminency of his son, Yeshua, who came and dwell among us. So yes, we want to look at that imminency of his transcendency. In that Yeshua, who had all the fullness of the Yahed in him, he came and dwelt among us and lived even as a man would, but he did so without sinning. We want to look at that. And we also want to look at how he uses clothing. Not physical clothing, but his robe of righteousness. And how that typifies... Clothing is linked to righteousness. It's a typification. When we talk about nakedness in the scriptures, we want to look at that. But to consolidate the point that I wish to make is, join me in the book of Malek Aleph, that's First Kings. Chapter 8, and the word says, Then Shalomah, that Solomon, assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel, to sovereign Shalomah in Jerusalem, to bring up the ark of the covenant of Yahweh from the city of Malek David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled to sovereign Shalomon at the festival in the month of Ithanim, which is the seventh new moon, meaning this is the month of Tishri. And all the elders of Israel came and the priests took the ark and brought up the ark of Yahweh and the tent of appointment and all the set apart utensils that were in the tent and the priests and the Levites brought them up and suffering Shalomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembly which with him were with him before the ark slaughtering so many sheep and cattle that they could not be counted of number. You see, worship is a transitive verb. It requires an object. And here we see Solomon creating an environment that is conducive for worship. 
When you come, you sing songs, you pray, you read the scriptures. So worship is this transitive verb. And therefore, Yah does not call us to an intransitive worship. And all we can do for those intransitive worshipers is to commiserate with them. The word says that Solomon in verse 19 made the point, only you do not build the house, but your son who is coming from your loins, he does build that house. Solomon said, I'll build a house for you. That's talking about his eminence. Meaning, although Yah is so big, he makes himself present to us in that he condescends. So Solomon here is talking about his eminence. Let's look now at his transcendence. Verse 27 of the same passage. For it is true, Elohim dwells on the earth. See, the heavens and the heavens of the heavens are unable to contain you. How much less this house which I have built. Yah's transcendency is such that we cannot conceive him. We cannot see him in essence, but he reveals himself in his eminency through the sun. And that was the transaction that took place at Calvary. We brought our sins, and he gave us righteousness. He covered us with his righteousness. So that righteousness that caused us to stand justified before the Father, it's imputed. And the righteousness that sanctifies us, that is imparted. And that's why Paul, Shaul, the apostle said, we must now work out the imputed righteousness that is in us outwards, in fear and in trembling. So we want to look at that this morning, how, as I indicated earlier, Yah uses clothing, whether we are naked or we have clothes on, and typifies that as being saved. We're going to look at that. But before we do, or in the process of doing so, I would like for you to turn with me to the book of Debriha Yamin Aleph. Now that might be too much for you. That simply means First Chronicles and chapter four. First Chronicles chapter four, and I'm going to read a few verses there. Now understand that the Chronicles, when people read them, often they encounter a list of names. They're public records because we, we believe Ezra is the author of the Chronicles and he wrote this because he was on his way now to rebuild Jerusalem. And when you're building a city or a kingdom, you need records. So he is listing all the names of the people that are involved and we have found ourselves here this morning where we want to look at just a portion of that and then we will shine the light of his eminence of that so that we may understand the transcendency of the message that he sends to us. So come with me to verse 21 of the fourth portion of the book of Chronicles. That's First Chronicles. And the word says... The sons of Shelah, the son of Yehuda, that's Judah, Ur, the father of Lika, 
and Leda, the father of Mesha, and the clans of the house of the linen workers of the house of Ashbia, and Joachim, and the men of Koziba, and Yoash, and Seraph, who ruled in Moab. And Yeshubi Lehim, Yeshubi Haim, this is um, Bethlehem, this means the house of bread. But the records are ancient. Did you hear that? The records are ancient. These were the potters and those who dwell at Nathim and Ghidorah. There they dwelt with the suffering for his work. They dwelt with the king. I just read from the scriptures. And so the word here in the list of all these names, we find three verses that speaks to us in a way that perhaps you've never been spoken to before. Remember, all that happened to ancient Israel in a physical sense is now being revealed to us in a spiritual sense. So we need to understand the spiritual application of that which was pragmatic among ancient Israel. And so this morning we want to dilate upon these three verses here. And the first thing that we want to look at is ask ourselves, who is Sheila? Who is Sheila? Now you know Sheila very well. You just don't remember who Sheila is. Because when you read the book of Genesis, Barashit, chapter 38, you see what seems like a parenthesis, a defined parenthesis. Because from chapter 37 to chapter 50, it's dealing with that young man called Yosef or Joseph. Having been sold to the Ishmaelite, he's taken to Egypt. And we know subsequently he became a great leader in Egypt. But chapter 38 is dealing with Judah. As I indicated, it's like a parenthesis in there, a divine parenthesis. And there is a message that Yah wants us to know. And in that chapter, we read that Judah had three sons. He had her, Honan, and Sheila. We also read that they died because they did wickedly. And Jacob had sought not to give Sheila to Tamar. And Tamar deceived him. So we pick up in this passage also two women. And so we want to highlight that because Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2 makes it clear that Yah likens the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. So we're dealing with two women. And the two women is, one is the wife of Potiphar, who tried, made an attempt to seduce Joseph and Joseph ran. And we're also dealing with the allurement, how Tamar deceived Judah, and then later on gave birth to twins, and those twins became the ancestors of the Messiah. That's the essence of that story. But it seems as if we had forgotten who Sheila is. So we pick up Sheila here. This is the third son of Judah. 
And we want to understand the, the spiritual application here because we're living in the end time. And these things are important. The word says, the sons of Shelah, the sons of Yehuda, Ur, the father of Lika, and Leda, the father of Merish, Merisha, and the clans of the house are linen workers. Understand that. They are linen workers. As we read through the scriptures, we see that linen was not for the ordinary person. Linen was used to make garments for the rich and for the kings, for the priests and for the kings. Linen. So as we read here, we said Sheila was unlike his other brothers. The word here is trying to tell us righteousness. Because when we read Revelation, let's go to Revelation and keep your finger in First Chronicles. Revelation 19 and verse 8, the word says, And to her was given to be dressed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the set apart one. The right, the, the fine linen is the righteousness of the saint. So when you read in the word of Yah about fine linen, it's talking about righteousness. And this is why I said earlier that Yah, when he talks about clothing, he's talking about our righteousness. <laughs> so you understand now what Isaiah says in chapter 64 and verse 6, I believe it says that your righteousness is like filthy rats because we have none. That which we have is imputed to us by way of Yeshua. So the word says that Sheila and his clan, they were what? <coughs> They make linen clothes, righteousness, unlike his brothers. Her and Onan. Then the word says that these men, they ruled, they had dominion in Moab. Don't miss that. I can't but emphasize the point that we're dealing with the spiritual application of what happened to them physically. They ruled in Moab. And to understand the, the context of that, you must come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 23. Turn with me there. Deuteronomy chapter 23. The word says, he who is wounded by crushing of testicles or whose penis is cut off, it's in the word, shall not enter into the community of Yahweh. A mamza shall not enter the community of Yahweh, even at tenth generation of his shall not enter the community of Yahweh. An Amorite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of Yahweh even a tenth generation of them shall not enter into the assembly of Yahweh. Now, the word says these descendants of Shula they ruled in Moab. Moab, as you know, was the enemy of Israel. The Moabites. They are the incestuous generation of Lot when his daughter slept with him. And Yah makes it clear in the book of Deuteronomy that the Moabites could not come into his temple. They could not come to give worship until the 10th generation. But it says that that these men, they were rulers. They had dominion over the enemy. 
And this morning, then, you need to ask yourself, who is your Moab? Who is the Moab that has become an enemy to you? You're not ruling over Moab, are you? Moab is ruling over you. But these men, it says that they have dominion over Moab. There's sins in our lives that have become the Moabs in our lives. And we need to rule over them. Whether you are an alcoholic, a fornicator, an adulterer, these are the Moabs in your life that you need to have dominion over them. Maybe you're a liar. Maybe you steal. But these are the Moabs that yet... You don't have dominion over, but you need to have dominion over the Moabs that have become an irritant to you. Such were the sons of Shur. Such were they. You know, it is said that if you break a harm or you break a bone there is a process of healing but where that bone was broken and is healing it is now stronger than the surrounding bone that's what he said what's my point my point is, if you were an alcohol, where you were fornicated, and you have gotten victory over those, you are now stronger in those areas than you were because Satan can no longer tempt you in those areas. You are now reigning. You have dominion over those Moabs in your life. You have dominion over them. And the word goes on to say that these are the ancient records. These are Yah breathed. These are not the words of men written as some would have you believe. Holy men were inspired by Yah and they spoke these words and these words are self-executing. They're ancient. These were the potters. Notice the characteristics of these people. Because when we read in Jeremiah chapter 18, Jeremiah is told, go down to the potter's house. And look, Jeremiah, and Jeremiah saw a piece of clay. That's us. We see that in Genesis, when he made Adam, out of a piece of clay. Go down to the potter's house. Go down to the potter's house and when you go down to the potter's house you make sure that you take note and when you take note Jeremiah says I saw I saw a piece of clay that was marred on the wheel because the potter was trying to shape the clay and the clay would not be obedient to the potter's hand. It says these people were potters. They know how to make a good vase. So when we get saved, we repent and we come into the word and we begin to study Yah then begins to shape us as a potter does a piece of clay. And sometimes when that potter is handling the clay, the clay is inclined to fall off the potter's wheel. And Yah wants to leave his prints in us but we are not always that subtle in his hand and so 
the, the word says these people, they were puppets. And not only that, it says they dwelt with the king. They dwelt with the sovereign. Notice that this young man, Sheila, he is the son of Judah, Yehuda. And in Genesis chapter 49, we see what? In verse 10, we see, and the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh, the Messiah, comes. So the word says he dwelt, they dwelt with the king, with the sovereign. Because that's the royal tribe, the largest of all the tribes, Judah. And, and that's why, you know, Judah was joined with Benjamin and later on Levites, because the Levites, when they went up north with the rest of the ten tribes, and Jeroboam, as you know, decided to keep them idle and chose men who were not worthy to serve. They left and came back south and joined. So when we talk about Jews, we're really talking about three tribes. We're talking about Levites, Benjamin, and Judah. We need to understand that. The rest of the tribe remained up north, and as you know, they were taken into captivity and never returned. So Yah wants to cover us. And the reason I'm emphasizing this point is because Passover is just a few weeks away from now. Passover is a few weeks away from now. And I just want to remind you, you already know, but I'm going to be reading from Bereshit chapter 3. Bereshit chapter 3. And I'm reading from the Septuagint scriptures. And I just want to say this for emphasis. So the Septuagint predates the Masoretic text from which the King James is taken from by about 1200 years. And this Septuagint here was commissioned in Egypt, North Africa. And so I have a liking for it because it's ancient record, if you understand what I'm saying. Chapter 3. And I read verse 6 and 7, and the word says, And when they had eaten, the eyes of them, talking about Adam and Eve, both their eyes were open, and they perceived that they were naked. Remember what I said earlier? I said, yeah, uses nakedness to typify righteousness. If you are naked, it means you are not righteous. Understand that? When a church is naked, the people are not righteous. They are not living righteously. Let me read that again. And when they had eaten, their eyes, both of them, were opened. And they perceived that they were naked. And they sewed together fig leaves and made for themselves girdles. And when they heard the sound of Yah, Elohim, walking in the garden in the evening, both Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yah, Elohim. Now understand what's happening. This morning I opened up and I spoke about the transcendency, the transcendent robe of Yah. At that time in the Garden of Eden, it covered Adam and his wife. Are you with me? They were covered by his transcendent robe of righteousness. That's our topic today. But when they sinned, it was at that point that they realized that they were naked. And unless we have that transcendent robe covering us, despite of our well dressed, we may think we are, we are naked, the word says. It's a typification of righteousness. Notice what happens then. Having realized 
that they are naked, they now sought to find clothes for themselves, even as many do today with their trinkets. <laughs> they went out and they sewed fig leaves to cover themselves, not realizing that unless you cover with that transcendent robe of righteousness, you are still naked. But interestingly, they knew that they were naked. They knew. Now, it seems an ironic and paradoxical in the sense that before you put clothes on, you were clothed, but now you have clothes on, you're naked. Did you see that? They were in the garden naked covered by the righteousness of Yah, and there was no shame. But now they have fig leaves on, and they say, we were hiding because we were naked. Now think of the contemporary world in which we live. Rather than living by the pure word of Yah, that sanctifies us, because truth does that. Your word is true, and true, according to John 17, 17, it sanctifies us. But the churches, the denomination, the institution, they had things, and they put things in, and they tried to cover the people with all kinds of doctrinal make-beliefs. And the word says that all these are fig trees, religion. Fig trees. So the word says that Yah had to get an animal, kill that animal, take the skin, and cover them. So that they realize at that point that there is no forgiveness of sin unless there be the shedding of blood, Hebrews 9.22. It is a work of blood, not of leaves. You better understand that. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And so, it wants you to know that when he speaks, in the word that you're naked is because you're not living righteously. So you better come with me now to the book of Revelation. That's Azon. And uh, let's look at the third portion of Azon. And that which relates to the contemporary church in which you and I are part of, Laodicea. Let's start at verse 14. And the message of the assembly of Laodicea writes, the amen, the trustworthy and true witness, the beginning of the creation of Elohim, says this, I know your works. Yeah. That you are neither cold nor hot. You're insipid. I would rather that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm going to vomit you out. You make me sick. Out of my mouth. Because you say you're rich. Watch the irony now. We just looked at the irony in Genesis chapter 3. That Adam and Eve had no clothes on but they were clothed by righteousness. But when they put their own clothes on, it was then that they became naked. Watch this. Because we are, what are we doing? We're juxtaposing what happened to Adam and how that relates to the contemporary church in Laodicea. That's all the churches collectively, regardless of what names they put on it and ascribe to themselves. There's only one assembly, and we find an assembly in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23. The general assembly. Understand that. So let's watch the irony now. Verse 17, because you say you're rich, 
Laodicea says it is rich. Of course, Laodicea is talking about economics. And I am made rich, says Laodicea, and need none at all. And do not know that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Did you get that? Let me say that again for emphasis. Laodicea, that contemporary church that houses all the denominations, regardless of what names they ascribe to themselves, their component parts come together, sums up, is one. They think they're rich. You hear of these mega churches, and you hear of the prosperity gospel, and you hear of the millions of tithes and offerings that they collect each year. But the word says they're poor. They're pitiable. Blind. And naked. Meaning, all these churches they're not living righteously. Understand that. We are dealing with the spiritual application of what was happening to the sons of Shula. We said earlier that two women approached. One approached Joseph and Joseph ran. She was trying to seduce him. He ran. Judah walked into that situation with his eyes open. This is his son. You don't hear much about him. We hear about Honan and her, who obviously heard. But Shula, a man who sought fine linen, not just linen, he sought righteousness. Perhaps he learned from the experiences of his father and also his brothers. And he ruled over Moab. And so these two women are being juxtaposed in the spiritual sense. We have one in Revelation 12, which is the true woman. And we have one in Revelation chapter 7, the false woman. You could call her Mrs. Potiphar. You may do that. In fact, the Bible doesn't name her, but the Jesha names her. Her name is Zelika. Zelika. That's the wife of Potiphar. Zelika. Let me read you a few um, verses here. Turn with me in your Bible. We wouldn't say this to an average gathering, but we can say it here in the book of Yesha and to chapter 44. Chapter 44 of Yesha, and we'll begin at verse 12. And the word says, And Yah was with Yosef, and he became a prosperous man. And Yah blessed the house of Potiphar for the sake of Yosef. And Potiphar left all that he had in, in the hand of Yosef. And Yosef was one that caused things to come in and go out. And everything was regulated by his wish in the house of Potiphar. And Joseph was 18 years old at this time. He was 18 years old, a youth with beautiful eyes and comely appearance. And like unto him was not in the whole land of Egypt. Did you hear that? There was none like Yosef. The man is in prison. He's been seduced. But he has fine linen on. Are you with me? He has righteousness in him. And at that time, whilst he was in the master's house, going in and out of the house and attending his master, Zilika, 
His master's wife lifted up her eyes toward Yosef, and she looked at him, and behold, he was a youth comely and well favored. And she covered, the, she coveted his beauty in her heart, and her soul was fixed upon Yosef, and she enticed him day after day. And Zilika persuaded Joseph daily. But Joseph did not lift up his eyes to behold his master's wife. He wore fine linen. But this was not the same with Yehudi. It was not the same with Judah. Judah went looking, where are the prostitutes here? In the same way that Samson later on, being a judge of Israel, he was looking all the way for prostitutes, went up to Gaza, took away their iron gate, and fell in love with a prostitute. Well, Revelation 17 tells us that this woman is a prostitute. Are you with me? So, Adam and Eve knew that they were naked, but the church of Laodicea doesn't know who then is in the worst condition. The man who can see or the man who cannot see. The man who refused to see is in a far worse condition than the man who cannot see. Laodicea is naked, doesn't have fine linen, and is blind, cannot see its own nakedness. Adam saw it. So what am I, what am I telling you? I'm showing you the decline. Adam sin and knew his sin. Today when people sin, they don't hide. Adam was hiding. Today they are brazen, beer face, right in your face. I'm doing this and if you don't like it, so be it. That's how they speak in the culture where we live. And they use money to buy everything. Not knowing that money cannot buy souls. And so we are now left to look at this matter in Jeremiah 18, 1, 3. And the word came to Jeremiah from Yahweh saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and here I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. Remember, we just read that the sons of Shula, they were potters. They were potters. We read that. And so they know how to form a good vase, a good cup. The spiritual application is we here, we are the clay, as I indicated earlier, and we are on the potter's wheel. He wants to leave his imprint on us. But we keep falling off the wheel. We keep falling off the wheel. So come with me now to Revelation chapter 12. Because I want to take this somewhere in the context of what is going to be happening. It's going to be happening. Because the question is apt at this stage to be asked. Even as Solomon's mother wrote to Lemuel and she asked the question in Proverbs chapter 31, or Mishli, 31 and verse 10, 
Who can find a virtuous woman? Who can find a capable woman? For her price is far above rubies, the art of her husband does safely trust her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him what? Good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax. Did you get that? She seeketh wool and flax. If you didn't know, linen comes from flax. This woman is dealing with righteousness. You, you didn't get me. I said Bathsheba, who committed adultery with David, who is repented, has repented, is now writing Mishli chapter 31, and she's letting you know she's now looking for fine linen. Righteousness. And she's warning her son, don't give yourself all over to a woman. The woman will deceive you, even as the church has deceived many. Oh, yes. These things we are told are written for how? For our admonition. That's what we're told. The other thing we read in the scriptures relating to the son of Judah is that they dwelt among plants and hedges. Now, you read that and you're wondering, why is it there dwelling among plants and hedges? And, and what do we need to know about that? Well, plants in the Bible is about growth and development. That's what plants are. When you read about plants, in the book of Genesis, you see, he put the plants there and he tells them to grow. Grow! That's what plants represent. And the edge is protection, like he protected Job. He put a hedge around Job, and he protected them. And he protected the children of Israel while they were in Goshen. He put a hedge around them. And so the spiritual application of that is that he wants us to grow. And while we're growing, he protects us around with edges. Did he not say the angel encamped like a fence around us? We've got to understand that as we study and consider this divine parenthesis, a kind of a moral insertion, a, a spiritual interlude within the ethnographic story of Judah and of Joseph. That's what we're dealing with today. I and mean, it's ethnographic study of them so we can understand the spiritual application and how we ought to respond in this last days so he covered Adam and Eve but now he's begging Laodicea buy from me I saw one so you may see because Laodicea doesn't believe it's naked. Laodicea doesn't believe that. So come with me, as I indicated, to chapter 12 of Azon. That's the book of Revelation. And we start from about verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness. That's the church. Started out as Israel. And now we're dealing with the remnant of that woman, the seed. Remember, there's only one woman. True woman. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by Halloween to be nourished there 1,260 days. And there came to be fighting in heaven. Some translations say war in heaven. Michal and his messengers fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his messengers fought, but they were not strong enough, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Did you get that? Let me say that again. In another way, those with hunger and bitterness and who are quick to fight 
Heaven is not a place for you. Are you with me? We see here that he who started trouble in heaven was thrown out because heaven is intended to be a peaceful place. And so whatever is happening in heaven, Yah told us when you pray, he's saying, pray this way, let the culture, let the quietness, let the stillness of heaven come on earth as it is in heaven. But who came down? Satan. War. And so you're still wondering what's happening in Ukraine and Gaza? It's because the war that is taking place in mid-heaven is otting up. Prophecy is unfolding right before your eye, but all you see is politics. Why? Because you're blind and you're naked. That's what the word says. So let's read on. Verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who leads all the world astray. How many people of the world he leads? All of them astray. He was thrown to the earth, and his messenger were thrown out with him. I want you to keep your finger on verse 9, because I want you to follow me now. Because we want to look at something and ask questions to see whether or not it could be this way. Just come with me. So he was thrown down to the earth, he and his cohorts, the demons. And I heard a loud voice saying in the heaven, And now have come the deliverance of the power of the reign of our Elohim and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of the brothers, our brother, who accused them before our Elohim day and night has been thrown down. Did you get that? It says, while you are here sinning, committing fornication, committing adultery, while you're stealing, while you're lying, and you think you get away with it, Satan takes that which you're doing and right in front of the Messiah accuses you. Look what they're doing. That's what it says. And how often does he do it? Day and night. There's no respite. You didn't get away with it. Because the one who enticed you to do it is the same one who's taking it and bringing it back and accusing you. I hear Justin Iron says, carry go bring come. You better believe it. This is his name. All right. So he accuses us day and night. And they overcame him. Did you get that? They had dominion over Moab. That's what the word is trying to tell you. Verse 11. Because of the blood of the Lamb. Are you with me? Because Yah covers us with that transcendence, righteousness of Yeshua's blood. The eminency of his transcendency. And that's what we're dealing with this morning. And because of the word of their weakness, and they did not love their lives today. So it's not only that they're saved, they have to do something. It is he who doeth his will, the same shall be saved. Notice what he said, because of the word of their weakness. Because of the, this rejoice, O heavens, and who dwells in them, woe to the earth. Woe to the what? The earth and the sea. Now, the earth and the sea. It's not the sea on the earth. And I wonder why the writer does that. But you'll see why I am being specifically um, pensive about that. You'll see in a minute. Woe to the earth and to the sea. Why? Why, why is that? Because the devil has come down to you having great wrath, knowing that he has a little time. Satan knows that you and I are living in the sixth seal. 
The next seed is the coming of Yeshua. He knows the time far more than you do. And that's why he tries to put you on a different calendar. So you are not following the biblical calendar. You are following the Gregorian calendar. So in a few weeks from his Passover, you will think you're only in Easter. That's part of the deception of Satan. And he's using human instrumentalities to induce and seduce you, even as that Mrs. Potiphar tried to seduce Joseph. But Joseph, remember, was that young man who his father had in his whole hate. You remember his mother died on the way, giving birth to Benjamin. Remember that. And, and, and watch what Jacob does. Jacob. Because later on, when Rachel died, because you know Rachel was the love woman, even as in chapter 12 here, we're dealing with the love woman, the woman who is love. Understand where I'm going? This is Rachel here. She's loved. Rachel dies on the way, and, Joseph, and Jacob buries her. So Reuben, the firstborn now, thinks that, okay, the loved one, the, 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 the wife who is loved, is, is going, is, has died. So therefore, Jacob is going to take his bed and, and bring it in the tent of Leah, who was not loved. But Jacob didn't do that. Jacob put his bed in Bilah's tent. Because Rachel had strange eyes. I'm not Rachel, Leah had strange eyes. We would say from where I come, cockeyed. So she wasn't loved. But Reuben assumed that now that she's, Rachel is out of the way, his mother, Leah, would become preeminent. When that didn't happen, the word says in Jesha that he went to into Bilah's tent, took out his father's bed, and slept with the concubine. And as a consequence of that, what happened? Jacob, when he's blessing them, he said, J J um, Reuben, I can't use you. You are my firstborn. You are my might, my excellence, but you are as unstable as water. I can't use you. And he gave that blessing to Joseph. Gave that to Joseph. And Joseph, as you know, produced Ephraim and Manasseh from North Africa. You know that story very well. And so we're dealing with this typification of Potiphar's wife. And also the true woman. So the dragon is wrath, angry. Right? And the hurt is in turmoil, turmoil because of that. Verse 13, and when the dragon saw that he had been thrown to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. He persecuted Israel. And I want you to get this right. I'm always having to make this point that when I speak of Israel, I'm not speaking of geographical Israel. I'm speaking of the Israel, those of the people who have accepted Yeshua, and are obedient to him. Not geographical. I'm talking about Galatians 6, 16, the Israel of Yah, that is based not on physical birth, but on spiritual rebirth. That's what I'm dealing with. So he's angry. And the woman, verse 14, was given two wings of an eagle. Stay with me. The dragon was cast down into the earth, and the woman was given two wings of a great eagle to fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and time and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And out of the mouth of the serpent spew water like a river after the woman to cause her to be swept away 
to the river. If you don't understand this, now you're going to understand. This is talking about here in Revelation 12, the period of the church of Sardis. This is the Reformation period. Did you hear me? This is the church of the Reformation. When the church decided that it would reform the church of Thyatira, it didn't go all the way to the church of Ephesus because it was Ephesus that lost its first love. By the time you get to Thyatira, there's no love. So we are told that the church of Sardis as a name. And when we hear preachers preach, they tell us about Zwingli and Luther and Calvin and Erasmus and all the great so-called men of the church. But the word said that you have a great name, but you're a dead church. I'm not knocking, just saying what the word says. That the church of Sardis is, is a dead church. So my point is simply this. This church you read of in Revelation 12 is the church of the Reformation where the churches from Europe, the Lollards, the Pilgrims, the Plymouth Brethren, from Holland, from Germany, they all fled from Europe. The church is running. And the Bible tells us that the church was given two wings like an eagle. Where did these people come? The people came to America. The eagle, the bald eagle. I'm throwing this out for you to examine it. And watch what happened. We have the, the Lutheran church that became the state church of Germany. The Lutheran church. The Anglican church became the church, the church of England. It was a state church. It is a state church. The Presbyterian church became the state church of Scotland. The Reformed church became the state church of Switzerland. The Dutch Reformed Church became the state church of Holland. So all of these churches, Constantine had originally made them state religion. And you know in the Bible that the priest and the king were two separate entities. Two separate entities. So the point is this, that in verse 16, come with me there, chapter 12, it says, and the earth, remember, the word says that the dragon was thrown down to the earth. Many conclude that the earth is the global earth that they're talking about. One gets the impression, though, that he's talking about an earth within the earth, in that it's a portion of land rather than the global earth. And this is why I said that. The church that fled Europe, it came to a specific place. They all came to America. And in verse 16, it says, and the earth helped the woman. We could say, and the earth helped the church. And swallowed up all the river which the dragon had spewed out on his, out of his mouth. Because what happened? The Spanish Inquisition, the Armada they sent to England to kill all the people, they killed the Huguenots, Bloody Mary, and all of that took place. All of this was chasing the woman to bring them back to Catholicism. But they all came to America. This is the reality. So when they came to America now, because obviously many of them were still breaking the commandment because they were not keeping the seven-day Sabbath. 
not keeping it. And they were not keeping the feast days. They did well in what they were able to do. They resisted Rome. They resisted Rome. But verse 17 says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to fight with the remnant. We're not dealing with all the churches now. We're dealing with the remnant. So the remnant among all the churches are the people who keep the commandment of Yah and they have the faith, the testimony of Yeshua. They not only keep the Ten Commandments, they keep the feast day, they keep the cycle, they keep the Passover, they keep the Feast of Pentecost, they keep the Feast of Tabernacle, they keep all of them, they keep Yom Kippur, Shavuot, Sukkot, they keep all of them. That's the remnant, Revelation 12 and verse 70. And so Satan, the dragon, is no longer angry with the ones who are breaking the command and some of who are saying Sunday is the Sabbath. He's not angry with them. They've already been seduced by Mrs. Potiphar. Zilika. They have a Zilika religion. But he's angry with those little ones who keep the commandments and have the testimony of Yeshua. And so it doesn't matter whether you are from Moab. You can escape it. Are you with me? You can escape it. You forget that Ruth was from Moab, don't you? Huh? Ruth was from Moab. And what did she do? She found herself, what? A clansman redeemer. And she, she liked what Naomi had. Because Naomi was from Judah, from the same place where Shula was born. From that household. And she noticed something peculiar. Notice what the word said there. It said, they lived with the king. And they wore fine, what? The Bible says, he wants us to be, what? Kings and priests. Linen was for kings and priests. And so the righteousness is such that we must cultivate. So this brings me now to America to focus on what is going to happen on the 8th and thereafter. I'm not setting dates, but we know that there is going to be a total eclipse. And 14 days after, there is going to be Passover, Pesach. But if we cast our mind back to the ancient, ancient text, as we read earlier, there was a Passover in Egypt, and when the angel of death passed by, and those who did not listen, what Moses was saying, they perished. We've said it before, we we'll say it again for emphasis. That on the 8th, there is going to be an X where they intersect at Little Egypt in Illinois, Carbon Day, in that village. And the X that is written is in the form of Aleph Tab. It's the sign that we see, that we read off in Ezekiel chapter 9. Is letting you know that those who are not clothed in the righteousness, they're in danger. You still have time. You still have time. 
So let's bring this together and look at it in the context of Isaiah chapter 24. Come with me as we close on this. Beolia is about to destroy. The what? To destroy the inhabitants. Let's read it because from your scripture it says something else, but I'm reading from the Septuagint Kodesh scriptures. It says, Behold, Yah is about to destroy this inhabited land. This inhabited land. Is that definitive or not? What part of speech is that? Okay. This inhabited land. He will lay it waste and uncover the face thereof and scatter abroad them which dwell therein. Now, if this is dealing with the earth on a whole, where abroad can you go from the earth? Oh, I get it. That's why these men are trying to get to space. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a specific place, this land. He says that he will destroy it. Now, when I think of that, I think of the fact that where the intersection takes place, stretching all the way from Texas all the way up to the east, it's right on that belt where the earthquake is the zone is more pronounced. So he says, I'm going to destroy this inhabited land. It will lay it waste and uncover the face thereof and scatter abroad them who dwell therein. People so with the priest, so with the servant, so with the master, and so with the maid, so with the mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the debt debtor, so with the creditor. With destruction, the land will be destroyed, and with spoiling this land will be ransacked, for the Mount of Yah has spoken it. The land mourned and the empire is destroyed. See what he says? Empire, not the earth. The Septuagint is trying to teach us something. The lofty people of the land mourn. As for the land, and he's telling you here why he's doing it. It says, because they transgressed the law and changed the institutions, the everlasting covenant. Did you get that? Let, let, let me dilate upon that it says they have changed the everlasting covenant to understand that you have to go back all the way to genesis chapter 9 after the flood and yahweh made a covenant with noah with the plants with the animal it was everything he made the covenant with and then he put a rainbow in the sky and said, this is a sign. This is my bow. My question to you today, what has America done with the rainbow? Do I need to conjecture to you what they've done with it? Was it not on the 26th of June, 2015, that they said, the Supreme Court, that it's all right now for two men of the same gender or two women of the same gender to come together in an institution called marriage that Yah established in Eden. That's what they said. The word here says that they have, what? Disobey the law and they have, what? Transgress. Oh, yes. They have changed the institution. I like that better. 
Because we're talking about marriage institution. We're talking about Sabbath institution. And here it says in the Septuagint, the institutions. Marriage is an institution. I think the Septuagint gets it right. Therefore, a curse devoured the land because they who dwell therein have sinned. Therefore, the inhabitants of the land shall be distressed and few men shall be left. This has not yet happened. I cannot tell you when it's going to happen. All I'm doing, like a guard dog barking, so that you hear the sound of the guard dog. Because if you don't take shelter then, you won't be able to deal with the, the bloodhound when he comes. What if this is really dealing with as we have conceived through the word here? The church ran to America, was helped by an eagle, eagle wing in the earth. Satan was thrown down to the earth. And now the earth has transgressed. Yes, it's true. All the earth has transgressed. But who has been the most predominant? Who is it when he sneezes? The rest of the world catches a cold. I'm just simply looking at this whole scriptures with new pair of eyes. Because not everyone will see this. Then you ask yourself, are we to assume that the greatest nation on earth that has ever lived is not depicted in scripture? Are we to assume that? My encouragement to you is this. Let us be like the sons of Shelah. Fine linen. Pontus. Don't be like our brothers and sisters. Honan and her. But help us, yeah, that we may have dominance and rule over Moab, the sins in our life. Let us overcome them so that we in the 10th generation can come back to your temple and give praise and honor to you. Because that's our calling. And therefore we will preach, will teach this everlasting gospel. And whether they believe it or not, we will tell them. Whether they hear us or not, we will tell them. It matters not whether they believe it. Isaiah said, who will believe our report? But whether they believe it or not, we will tell them. In Yeshua's name, we will tell them. Amen.